The Phoenix Suns were doubled up at halftime and dropped another disappointing home L to the Clippers on Tuesday night. On today's episode of Locked On Suns, elements of this loss were similar. There's some patterns here, but the most frustrating part of all is it doesn't all add up. Let's go. You are Locked On Suns, your daily Phoenix Suns podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. We are back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Brendan Clean, a credentialed media member covering the Suns for the past seven seasons, a writer at Dime Magazine, and the host of the Just Basketball Show, wherever you get your podcasts. I also create written and video content on the Locked On Suns Insider Community feed, which you can sign up for at the link in the show description below. Thank you for making Locked On Suns your first listen post game here on this Tuesday night. The final score, 105 to 92. We'll break down the game. As we roll on here, if you're finding us for the first time or you haven't done so before, hit the follow or subscribe button wherever you're finding this podcast. We are free and available everywhere, including YouTube. You hit that button, you get a new show in your feed every single Monday through Friday. You can become an everydayer, and I will help you get locked onto the Phoenix Suns all season long. And beyond that, of course, as well, into the offseason. Summer League, we're not there yet. We'll get there. I'll be there for you. All right. Today's episode brought to you by Game Time, the best place to buy a ticket no matter what the occasion. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. We'll get more into Game Time as we go, but let's get to the game. The Phoenix Suns lost in dismal fashion, made it a game, but it was still an embarrassing one. Thirty-seven to ten in the, after the first quarter, sixty-six to thirty-three at halftime. The f- deficit got as bad as thirty-seven at 53-16 to at one point in that second quarter. And here's the deal. Maybe you're depressed. Maybe you're just laughing at this point. Maybe you are looking for answers. The bottom line is, this felt incredibly close to a feeling that any Suns fan who has watched this team for more than this season will recognize because it is exactly the feeling that has ended the Suns season at home the past two years. Game six against Denver last season, game seven against the Mavs the year before. Obviously, credit to the Suns. They made it a game. They go small. They work mismatches. They bomb away from deep, and they're able to get back into the game a little bit, get to the line. But it had that feeling, especially in the first half. We'll get to some of the specifics of why the meltdown happened, what guys said afterward, and maybe how we could see them respond or how they're already responding. But as far as this season goes, this loss was not exactly the same as some of the ones we've seen, right? This was not the the Bucks loss. It wasn't exactly the same as a couple of recent OKC losses or the Spurs or whichever one you want to point to. It wasn't. Fourth quarter, Suns actually kept pushing. They outscored the Clippers by three in the fourth quarter. They didn't have a bunch of turnovers, only eight. They didn't give up a bunch of offensive rebounds or foul too much or you know any of those types of mental mistakes. Instead, they were... 14 of 27 at the rim. At one point, I believe it got to be 2 of 11. So that means they would have finished 12 of their last 16 at the basket. And they did get fouled a decent amount there, but they could not make a layup. A lot of their misses and turnovers that they did have in that first half led to runouts. So the Clippers tonight had how many fast break points? 25. So there's some things you can point to. But I think this started at minute one and how out of sorts and in a funk the Suns clearly were by not having Yusuf Nurkic 
and by not being ready for the first punch the Clippers were going to throw, minus Kawhi Leonard, minus James Harden, and they are also fighting for playoff seeding. I think those are the two things that kicked this game off in the wrong direction. We'll get to some of those as we go. But what I want to talk about is that feeling again, right? That, oh God, it's happening type of feeling. And I real I, I drove home, you know, 20, 30 minutes, whatever it is. And I was trying to sit there, right? I like to come to you guys with something, a take, some way to put it into perspective, a summary, a recap, some kind of thing you should be walking away from the game, feeling, thinking, holding on to. And so I was sitting there, what's, what do these games have in common? Game seven against Dallas, game six here. Even, you know, felt this way a little bit the last time these two teams played or the first time these two teams played when the Clippers won by 27. And they had 30-point leads throughout that game. I don't think there is anything that holds all of that together. I don't think there is a through line. Because, you know, there's some things you could throw out there, right? In, in the playoff environments, the Suns ran up in three years in a row against guys who can dictate outcomes of games. You've probably heard me use that phrase before. David Griffin used to say it about LeBron. There are a select few, count them on one hand, number of players in the NBA who can dictate outcomes of games single-handedly. They will have a say in the outcome one way or another. They will lose because they fail. They will win because they succeed. That's going to be how the game goes. Giannis, Luka, Jokic, those guys are on that list. The Suns probably don't have one of those players. Okay, but that game, or that game, that pattern doesn't apply here. Kawhi was out. PG's not quite at that level of guy. And he wasn't even perfect in this game. He wasn't necessarily perfect in this first half, uh, frankly. I mean, he shot fifty below 50% from the field, had six turnovers, just five assists. This was not a PG explosion game. Now, he was a lot better in the first half. I think he was one of five in the third quarter, and that skewed things. But still, he didn't have 40 in the first half or something the way Luka did in that game, right? You know, the roster is completely different from those past two playoff exits. Book is the only player left. But I wouldn't even necessarily say this felt like the same type of Booker breakdown, right? In a lot of these past games, Book has either physically not been there because of injuries or running out of steam or both, or uh, just become a turnover machine. He didn't do that here. He smoked a bunch of layups. He couldn't get the ball to go into the basket. I don't think he made a shot in the first quarter. Finally, at the end of the first quarter, got to the line, I think, four times, and then eventually made a layup in the second quarter, if I'm remembering correctly. That was the only shot he would go on to make the whole game. Had a key offensive rebound late, so there was still some fight. He had decent defensive moments against Paul George in that second half. But why did this happen, then, if... Personnel-wise, game flow-wise, statistically, it doesn't have the same stuff as those other ones. I don't know. I don't know. If you're feeling like fire the coach, if you're feeling like trade Booker, if you're feeling like you're just sick of this, I think those are all valid answers. I'm not saying I support those. I'm not saying that you'll feel that way when you wake up in the morning. But I get that sensation, I get that feeling, I get that reaction. To me, and I know I've said this before, and that's part of why I was trying to come up with something deeper or more connected. And you can tell me if you have one, because I'd love to hear it. Comment in the comments, tweet me, whatever you want to do. But the most frustrating thing to me is that there's no reason. That there's no answer, that there's no pattern. Because that means it's a lot harder to solve. Did they overlook the Clippers because their best player was out? Okay, that's a little bit of a pattern too. Did they get high on their own supply because they felt good coming off those three wins against good teams? Potentially. Is it all of the above? Probably. 
but it's not one thing. It's not a specific answer. And that is, <laughs> that's tough. And there's not an easy way out of it. Coming up next, I'll take you behind the scenes. How did the Suns react to this situation? Something Frank Vogel said before his press conference that you'll want to hear, as well as the energy in the locker room as we spoke with Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, and Royce O'Neal all coming up next. First, today's show brought to you by the Game Time app. With killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and a lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. They are also the exclusive or a, a exclusive and authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball now, meaning if you want to see the reigning National League champion D-backs this season, and I know I do, you're going to want to use game time. Let me be more specific. My favorite quality about the game time app is the seat view. I'm going to be looking for D-backs Padres tickets. Those are my two favorite teams. Yes, I have two teams that I like in the same division. I don't care. I know the seat views for Chase Field, mostly, but a lot of the time for concerts or comedy or some of these other things, I don't. But I, what I will use for baseball is zone deals where you choose a section, let game time choose the seats, get a little money shaved off when you go their route. Ticket coverage, lowest price guarantee to save you money, save you the stress and the hassle. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download their app, create an account, and use the code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, and use the code Locked On NBA L O C K E D O N N B A for twenty dollars off. Download the Game Time app today. Lowest price, last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. Closing out the no, keeping it rolling. We're not closing it. I wish we were. All right. Here's how I would describe the mood of Frank Vogel and the players after this loss, as well as during it, I would say, right? Some, some timeouts, some breaks in action, whatever. It is par for the course with what I think Frank Vogel is as a coach. And I, this is, I promise you, it's going to sound negative on a night where the result was negative, but I don't mean it to be a criticism. I'm just telling you that I think nothing surprised me about what I saw, all right? So during the game, like especially the first uh, timeout to stem the run that the Clippers were on, which I believe was, I don't even know, like 15 to two or whatever at the very beginning. I can get that point uh, exactly. Suns called a timeout at 7.58 in the first. The score was 17-2. to In that timeout, Vogel met with his coaches, you know, whiteboard, chatter, ch checking with the referees, doing their thing around the free throw line on their side of the court, as coaches often do. He left the players to be. He let them be. And... Couple moments later, Vogel, I believe, called four timeouts in the first half. So put that into perspective. One of those next ones, the two guys who stepped up or sort of were the most vocal were Devin Booker and Thad Young. Now, that was partially because Thad was getting ready to check into the game. 418 mark. The score was 28 to 4 by that point. And it was those two. It was Book, I think, seemingly talking about some defensive things. And then Thad chimed in and the guys were sort of gathering their, getting their heads straight, but listening, engaging, conversing. That was kind of the energy there. Third time out, if I'm remembering all this correctly, was when Vogel did get involved. So this would have been the, um, hold on. So 544, I think, would have been 
the second timeout. Third timeout was 418 when Thaddeus Young checked in. Maybe I'm thinking of a Clippers timeout. At one point, Vogel finally did sit down, drew up a play, and it was really like, we just need a basket. All right? They just needed a basket. And even then, it was pretty much left at that. Fast forward to post game. We are waiting outside the locker room because Vogel was taking so long that it got to the point where the locker room was going to be opened up. So we were going to go do player stuff first as media before having the press conference at the podium with Vogel. Sometimes the team will not put players at the podium if it's ugly. Tonight qualified there. So we knew, hey, if we're going to get players, it's going to have to be in the locker room, whatever. We're over there. Suddenly, Vogel comes from around the corner, starts walking to the podium. Well, we got to follow him. Obviously, he notices that. And he looks back at us and says, you might as well not, you might as well just go in there about the locker room because I'm not going to tell you crap. But he didn't say crap. Gets up there. I think he actually answered more and was more elaborative, elaborate than I would have guessed. He had some actual answers on what was the most frustrating in the first quarter. He said offensive toughness, not getting moved off your spots, and um, not being out physical the way that they were. That sounds familiar, I guess. That could have been a through line. Maybe that's the part that does make some sense if you've watched these games before. Said some things about, you know, the mentality and stick stick togetherness of the group and, and whatnot. We go to the Glock room, Booker and Durant kind of follow suit, right? Short answers to the point. Admirable, respectable that they would be sitting there dealing with it. You know, a lot of guys could leave. A lot of guys did leave, you know. I'm not trying to point fingers and say it's some big deal, but it's just a fact. Bradley Beal left before we were able to make our way in there. Grayson Allen was gone. He, even he's usually good to stick around and speak to the media. So just for perspective, and Book and Katie answered, but it was short. It was to the point. It was not really revealing of much. Kellen Olson of Arizona Sports, who does a good job, has covered this team literally longer than any of the daily day-to-day beat people. All the respect for Kellen. Steps up, asks, what's the level of accountability like in the locker room after so many of these moments? And Katie immediately jumps back with, what are you trying to ask? Kellen, to his point, love to see it, didn't back down. You know, Not that it's some hardball question really in the first place. I understand Durant's defensiveness. You know, He doesn't want to be taken out of context. He doesn't want to be misconstrued or be perceived as calling somebody out or being negative or whatever. I understand it's a group of guys. You're in a locker room. You're trying to go through a season. You want to stick together. You want to be on message. You want to be presenting the same thing and not have it feel like there's tensions. I get it, all of it. I, but I also get Kellen's point, right? I'm asking a question. And so Kellen re- repeated himself. I, he said, what I'm asking is how the level of accountability feels. And Durant said, I understand fans want to point a finger or put place blame on one person or all of these things. But, you know, he said, we lose as a team. That was his message. So to circle back, the reason I say it doesn't surprise me from a Vogel perspective that this would be the reaction after a game like this, which I think we can agree based on the fact that these moments won't go away and how much worse this one was, and the stakes, n- knowing now exactly what the stakes are. I mean, those other losses in the past were just as bad, but it was harder to see it. Now it's like, hey, win this game, you have a lot better shot at a six seed. This team's without its two best players. Win the damn game. They didn't. So that feels worse. I get all of it. But it doesn't surprise me that it was like this because this is what Vogel does. This is one of the things that I thought of as a positive when they hired him. The way that Vogel creates accountability, the way that he connects with his players is by he himself bringing a level of attention to detail and work ethic and passion that kind of speaks for itself, developing a mutual respect 
with his players, but ultimately, I think very intentionally when he was hired as a pivot from the last coach, Monty Williams, Vogel is not a guy who is going to get up there in a in front of the media, in front of even maybe his team at all times, and yell and shout and preach. Right? He is going to kind of coach by example, for lack of a better term, and bring guys with him. So Royce O'Neal got asked about what the coach's message was, and he kind of agreed with what Book and KD said. Now, you could have looked at them doing it and been like, okay, they're just trying to, you know, keep it moving. But Royce, it's like, he doesn't talk to media as much. He might not have his, be thinking about it in the same strategic way as the stars who are kind of always in that mode. And he said, Vogel's message was short and to the point. So, it feels to me like if there was some, if there was one specific thing that it needed to be harped on, it would have been. It feels like this team doesn't have a, as any more of a sense of this bizarre season than we do. Otherwise, I do think somebody would have stepped up and said it by now. I am going to be watching for the offensive toughness side of things. I think Vogel saying that was illuminating, you know, because I think we all can see it when we watch. And it is a connective point between a lot of these games. You know, guys get run off the three-point line or they get bumped off their spot or they get you know, harassed by a smaller defender or a, a, a theoretically a weak defender who they're not expecting to impact the game. And they don't always respond to that. But big picture, it is some of this stuff that is hard to quantify, hard to explain, and maybe that players aren't even like really able to put into words themselves, right? Effort, energy, confidence, comfort, throwing the first punch, all this type of stuff. So it shouldn't surprise you how this team has responded, good or bad. This is the makeup of this group. There isn't some big domino to fall or speech to be made. They are what they are. They know what they're capable of. But too often, despite what they're capable of, this is what they have done. And if it's going to change, it's going to be because it just flips. And they have to want that, right? All right, closing out the show, we'll get a little bit more on court. Specific. If you're picking one thing that was different about this game that led to the result, Yusuf Nurkic being out is where I would go. So we'll talk. The center rotation and the questions that are loud right now at that spot coming up next. First, today's show brought to you by Better Help. Sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off our chest. Big or small, certain things can really get to you in life and it's important to let them out, especially to somebody who is unbiased outside of your circle like a therapist. So today... I want to say something about how I'm really feeling, and you might even be thinking about the same thing this week. Here's one that I was chewing on as a follow-up to the last segment about the response. I was really feeling for fans in that locker room because people pour a lot of their time and money into following this team, and it is one thing to watch the failures, and it is another thing even if it's understandable from the perspective of the athlete, it is another thing to have to see the kind of yada yada ing, the kind of closed off responses, because you want it to kill these guys. You want it to matter so much, and it does, but you don't get to see that, and it's a bummer. Therapy can be different for everybody. Most of us have bigger problems than our favorite sports teams. Maybe not. Maybe. It's important to get things off your chest no matter what they are every once in a while. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA to get 10% off your first month and try it out. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA.
All righty, closing out the show here. Beat on the game as it played out in real time, 18 to 2, timeout, all that stuff is they were really feeling the absence of Yusuf Nurkic. Now, to an extreme level that should not ever get to 18 to 2 as a start, or 30 to 4, which I believe is what it got to. That's unacceptable. That's much bigger than Nurkic being out. But the start of the game that Eubanks had, I know the stats will lie here because he was the only Suns player who made a field goal in this quarter. But it was horrific. Simple stuff like a pass in the dunker spot off of a drive. He smokes a layup. They run some of their bread and butter offense that they've gotten really comfortable and good at lately in the side dribble handoff game with spacing and misdirection and confusion as far as who's running and who's screening and who's handling the ball, etc. Eubanks being the hub of that as the actual guy working the handoff and nothing. Guys are cutting. He can't make those passes the way Nurkic can. He's not as confident or comfortable setting a good screen and delivering the pass like a quarterback, you know, handoff. It, it just was not there. Defensively, Ivica Zubats is getting downhill, gets his own miss to start things off, makes the first shot of the game, gets an assist on the next one, gets inside for another one a moment later. And that's, of course, Eubanks' matchup. So, what do we see after that? Well, Eubanks gets one more shot after the first timeout, and ends up playing 12 minutes in the first half, does not play in the second half. So even though he's three of six, three offensive rebounds, whatever, in those 12 minutes, he had the worst plus minus on the team, and Vogel benched him. Vogel was also asked pregame about Eubanks and what he provides to the team, and I would, I would take more from what he didn't say than what he did say. What he said was physicality, rebounding, toughness, all that stuff. What he did not say is finishing, which is something you would think, in theory, Eubanks would be able to do. He did not really say, you know, overall, like, defense or rim protection necessarily. He said, you know, physicality, all that stuff. So, they try Thad Young. They try Bull Bull at center. Neither of those go great either. Thad... Missed a little bunny and didn't really impact the game too much as a passer. Obviously, we know the defensive limitations are always going to be there. Bull Bull airballed a three. And so they go small down the stretch. I do think the Suns, this is just a normal game that they have a good chance to win if Nurkic is in there. I know that might sound crazy because of how many other things went so poorly in that first half. Their transition defense sucked. They let Paul George get hot. They broke down mentally. I'm not saying Nurkic solves all those problems, but I do think that was, you know, moment zero as far as the ripple effect of everything that ended up accumulating into 53 to 16. On the plus side, this is not a serious thing for Nurkic. They're not sure if he'll play Wednesday, but it's not going to be weeks or anything. We know how valuable he is to this team, but that means that with a week to go until a potential play-in game, a week and a half to go before a first-round series would start, the Suns are now at rock bottom with their center rotation. Nurkic is always going to have matchups where it's a little dicey. So that's always going to be there. And behind him, today, they went 0 for 3 with Eubanks, Thad, and Bull. 
Now, Durant played good, played well as that backup five in a small ball look. Maybe you feel good about that. I'm not so convinced Vogel will always go back to that. He called it their comeback strategy or something like that. And by that point, he was a little bit fed up. So he said it's more complicated than just playing small ball. Okay, sure, but it worked. So maybe we see it, maybe we don't. Either way, that is only going to work in select minutes and small match uh, in small minutes because it's a lot physically for Durant and it asks him to do things beyond what he's best at, which is you know scoring and creating offense. So it's a big hole. It's a big question mark. It went a long way toward deciding this game, and it does not inspire optimism about the rest of the games this team's going to have to navigate. Fortunately or unfortunately, they have another shot at it Wednesday night. So this team again, 24 hours later, this time in their building, we'll see if the Suns have any response. I think history tells us they will, but again, what does that mean? Who knows? Hit follow, subscribe, get a recap show after the buzzer tonight, Wednesday in round two against the Clippers. I will talk to you then.